expose evil here. Like, share, subscribe. This is the Green Bomb speech. Originally entitled Hypnosis and MPD Ritual Abuse. But simply known as the Green Bomb speech now. And without further ado, here it goes. Many of you know Dr. Hammond from his work and presentations. Um, I have his curriculum vitae and his list of selected topics and talks that he's given uh, spans about five pages. Um, it's a heavy duty vitae. Um, you may be familiar with him also from his uh, recently published um, Hypnotic Metaphors book, a big red oversized book published by Norton uh, two years ago, which has the title of Big Red. Um, his education is that he took his BS, MS, and PhD from the University of Utah, the PhD in Counseling Psychology, Educational Psychology, and the Psychology Department. He is a diplomate in Clinical Hypnosis of the American Board of Psychological Hypnosis, a diplomate in Sex Therapy, the American Board of Sexology, a Clinical Supervisor and Board Examiner, American Board of Sexology, a diplomate in Marital and Sex Therapy, the American Board of Family Psychology, a licensed psychologist in the state of Utah, and a licensed marital and family therapist. So you can tell this man has a lot of experience and a lot of varied experience. He currently serves as research associate professor, physical med medicine and rehabilitation, University of Utah School of Medicine. He is the director and founder of sex and marital therapy clinic at the University of Utah. He has a private practice as a psychologist. He is an adjunct associate professor at the Educational Psychology Department at the University of Utah. In terms of his writing experience, he's the abstract editor for the American Journal of Clinical Hypnosis, a position he's held from 1986 to the present. He is an advisory editor and founding member of the editorial board of the Ericksonian Monograph. He is a referee of the American Journal of Clinical Hypnosis and the Journal of Abnormal Psychology and a reviewer and consultant to the National Center for Alcohol Education. He has received numerous professional honors, among them the Presidential Award of Merit of the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis in 1989, and the Urban Sector Award of the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis in 1990. In terms of his community activities, um, of special interest to this conference is he's a member of the Governor's Task Force on Ritual Abuse, Commission for Women and Families in the State of Utah. And then finally, as I said, he has uh, a multitude of presenting and training and teaching experience. In addition to that, he is currently the president of the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis and a fellow of that organization. And as I get to his publications, he's published several books. But I can't find them. Among them, the Handbook of Hypnotic Suggestions and Metaphors, published in 1990, W.W. W. Norton, Learning Clinical Hypnosis and Educational Resources Compendium in 1988 and currently has a book in preparation and under contract to W.W. W. Norton, Integrative Hypnotherapy, A Comprehensive Approach. Dr. Hammond is known as a foremost authority in the field of hypnosis and also is a very well-regarded educator in the field. So I urge you to welcome him, and I know we'll have a good training day. Thank you. today and uh, let me uh, give you a rough approximate outline of uh, the things that I'd like us to get into. First let me ask how many of you have had uh, at least one course or workshop on hypnosis? Can I see the hands? Wonderful. Okay, makes our job much easier. Okay, 
Uh, I want to start off by talking a little about uh, trance training and the use of hypnotic phenomenon with uh, an MPD dissociative disorder population. Uh, to talk some about uh, unconscious exploration, methods of uh, doing that, the use of imagery and symbolic imagery techniques for managing physical symptoms, input overload, things like that. Before the day's out, I want to spend some time talking about something I think has been uh, completely neglected uh, in the field of dissociative disorders, and that's talking about methods of profound calming for autonomic hyperarousal that's been conditioned in these patients. We're going to spend a considerable length of time talking about age regression and ab reaction and working through of trauma. I'll show you with a non-MPD patient some of that kind of work and then extrapolate from that of what I would do similar and different with MPD cases. Part of that I would add, by the way, is that I've been very sensitive through the years about taping MPD cases or ritual abuse cases. Part of it being that some of that feels a little like using patients and I think that this population has been used enough, and that's part of the reason by choice that I don't uh, generally videotape my work with them. Also, I want to talk a bunch about uh, hypnotic relapse prevention strategies, uh, post-integration therapy today, and finally, I'm hoping to find somewhere in our time frame to spend an hour or so talking specifically about ritual abuse and about mind control programming and brainwashing how it's done, how to get on the inside with that, uh, which is a topic that in the past I haven't been willing to speak about publicly. I've done that in small groups and in consultations, but recently decided uh, that it was uh, high time that somebody started doing it. So we're going to talk about specific that. Let me suggest now, um, we've got still a lot to, to cover. I would like to request that we take a 20-minute break. At least what I'll tell you is we're supposed to have a 30-minute break. In 20 minutes, I'm going to start talking about ritual abuse mind control programming. For those of you who would like a longer break, please feel free. For those of you who want other information, I'll see you in 20 minutes. from break. And I'll give you as much as we can in about 45, 50 minutes on the topic. While being in Chicago at the first international uh, congress where ritual abuse was talked about. And I can remember thinking, how strange and interesting. And I can recall many people listening to an example given that somebody thought was so idiosyncratic and rare, and all the people coming up after saying, gee, you're treating one too? Uh, you're in Seattle. Well, I'm in Toronto. Well, I'm in Florida. Well, I'm in Cincinnati. I didn't know what to think at that point. It wasn't too long after that, and I found my first ritual abuse patient in somebody I was already treating, and we hadn't gotten that deep yet. Things in that case made me very curious about the use of mind control techniques and hypnosis and other brainwashing techniques. So I started studying brainwashing and some of the literature in that area and became acquainted with, in fact, one of the people who had written one of the better books in that area. And um, then I decided to do a survey. And from some of the ISS, MP, and D folks, I picked out about a dozen and a half therapists that I thought were seeing more of that than uh, probably anyone else around. And I started surveying them. And the interview protocol that I had um, got the same reaction, almost without exception. The, the therapist said, you're asking questions I don't know the answer to. You're asking more specific questions than I've ever asked my patient. Many of those same therapists said, let me ask these questions and I'll get back to you with the answer. Many of them not only got back with answers, but said, you've got to talk to this patient. 
or these two patients. And I ended up doing um, hundreds of dollars worth of uh, telephone interviewing. What I came out of that with was a grasp of um, a variety of brainwashing methods being used all over the country. And I started to hear some similarities. And whereas I hadn't known to begin with how widespread things were, I was now getting a feel that there were a lot of people, there must be some degree of communication here. Then approximately two and a half years ago, I had some material drop in my lap. My source was saying a lot of things that I knew were accurate about some of the brainwashing, but was telling me new material I had no idea about. At this point, I took and decided to uh, check it out in, in three ritual abuse patients I was seeing at the time. Two of the three had what they were describing, a careful inquiry without leading or contaminating. The fascinating thing was that as I did a telephone consult with a therapist that I'd been consulting for for quite a number of months on an MPD case in another state, I told her to inquire about certain things. And she said, well, what are those things? And I said, I'm not going to tell you because I don't want there to be any possibility of contamination. Just come back to me and tell me what the patient says. She called me back two hours later, said I just had a double session with this patient, and there was a part of them that said, oh, uh, we're so excited. If you know about this stuff, you know how the cult programmers get on the inside, and our therapy is going to go so much faster. Many other patients since have had a reaction of wanting to pee their pants out of anxiety and fear rather than thinking it was a wonderful thing. But um, the interesting thing was that she then asked, what are these things? They were word perfect, same answers that my source had given me and my own patients, two out of my three patients had given me. I've since repeated that in many parts of the country. I've consulted in 11 states and one foreign country in some cases over the telephone, in some cases in person, in some cases giving the therapist information ahead of time and saying, uh, be very careful how you phrase this, phrase it in these ways so you don't contaminate. In other cases, not even giving the therapist information ahead of time so they couldn't. And when you start to find the same highly esoteric information in different states and different countries, from Florida to California, you start to get an idea that there's something going on that is very large, very well coordinated, with a great deal of communication and system systematicness to what's happening. So I have gone from someone kind of neutral and not knowing what to think about it all, to someone who clearly believes ritual abuse is real, and that the people who say it isn't are either naive, like people who didn't want to believe the Holocaust, or they're dirty. Now, for a long time, I would tell a select group of therapists that I knew and trusted information and say, spread it out, don't spread my name, don't say where it came from, but here, here's some information. Share it with other therapists if you find us on target, and I'd appreciate your feedback. People would question in talks and say, you know, they were hungry for information. Myself, as well as a few others that I shared it with, were hedging out of concern and out of personal threats and out of death threats. Uh, I finally decided to hell with it. They're going to kill me, they're going to kill me. It's time to share more information with therapists. Um, and part of that comes because we proceeded so cautiously and slowly, checking things in many different locations and finding the same thing. So I'm going to give you the way in with ritual abuse programming. I certainly can't tell you everything you want to know in 45 or 50 minutes, but I'm going to give you the essentials to get inside and start working at a new level. I don't know what proportion, honestly, of patients have this. I would guess that maybe somewhere around at least 50%, maybe as high as three quarters, I would guess maybe two-thirds of your ritual abuse patients may have this. What do I think the distinguishing characteristic is? If they were raised from birth in a mainstream cult, or if they were a non-bloodline person, meaning neither parent was in the cult, but cult people had a lot of access to them in early childhood, they may also have it. 
I've seen um, a ritual, more than one ritual abuse patient who clearly had all the kind of ritual things you hear about. They seemed very genuine. Uh, they talked about all the typical things that you hear in this population, but had none of this programming with prolonged, extensive checking. And so I, I believe in one case that I was personally treating that uh, she was from a kind of schismatic break-off uh, that had kind of gone off and done their own thing and were no longer hooked into a mainstream group. Here's where it appears to have come from. At the end of World War II, before it even ended, Alan Dulles and people from our intelligence community were already through Switzerland making contacts to get out Nazi scientists. As World War II ends, they not only get out rocket scientists, but they also get out some Nazi doctors who have been doing mind control research in the death camps. They brought them to the United States. Along with them was a young boy, a teenager, who had been raised in a Hasidic Jewish tradition and uh, a background of Kabbalistic mysticism that probably appealed to people in the cult because at least by the turn of the century, Aleister Crowley had been introducing Kabbalism into satanic stuff, if not earlier. And I suspect it may have formed some bond between them. But he saved his skin by collaborating and being an assistant to them in the death camp experiments. They brought him with them. And they started doing mind control research for military intelligence in military hospitals in the United States. And the people that came, the Nazi doctors, were Satanists. Subsequently, the boy changed his name, Americanized it some, obtained an MD degree, became a physician, and continued this work and appears to be at the center of the cult programming today. His name is known to patients throughout the country. What they basically do is they will get a child and they'll start this in basic forms, it appears, by about two and a half after the child's already been made dissociative. They'll make them dissociative not only through abuse, like sexual abuse, but also things like putting a mousetrap on their fingers and teaching the parents you do not go in until the child stops crying. Only then do you go in and remove it. Um, they start through rudimentary forms, at about two and a half and kick in high years, 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 six or six and a half, continue through adolescence with periodic reinforcements in adulthood. Basically, in the programming, the child will be put typically on a gurney. They will have an IV in one hand or arm. They'll be strapped down, typically naked. They will have wires attached to their heads to monitor electroencephalograph patterns and they will see a pulsing white, most often described as red, occasionally white or blue. They'll be given most commonly, I believe, Demerol. Sometimes it'll be other drugs as well, depending on the kind of programming. They have it, I think, down to a science where um, they've learned you give so much every 25 minutes until the programming is done. They then, as they have that, will describe a pain in one ear, their right ear generally, where it appears a needle has been placed. And they will hear weird disorienting sounds in that ear. While they see photic stimulation, external psychic driving to drive the brain into a brainwave pattern with a pulsing light at a certain frequency. Not unlike the goggles that are now available through Sharper Image and some of those kinds of stores. Then after a suitable period when they're in a certain brainwave state, they will begin programming. Let me give you an example of one kind of programming oriented to self-destruction and debasement of the person. In a patient at this point in time, about eight years old, who has gone through a great deal, early programming took place on a military installation. That's not uncommon. I've treated and been involved with cases who were part of this original mind control project as well as uh, having, having their programming uh, on military reservations in many cases. We find a lot of connections with the CIA. This uh, patient now 
was in a cult school, private cult school, where several of these sessions occurred a week. She would go into a room, get all hooked up, and they would do all of these sorts of things. And when she was into the proper altered state now, they were no longer having to monitor it with electroencephalographs. She also 